Well, good morning, Frontline Bible Church. It's good to be able to talk to you all on this Sunday amidst everything that is going on. Due to the recent COVID-19 pandemic and everything that is happening in our nation, and specifically in the state of Michigan at the stay-at-home mandate, unfortunately, we're not able to record the musical side of things as we have been the last couple weeks. However, it has really made me think, what is worship, you know? Being someone who is a musician, who relates to life and faith through music, and not being able to share that with you guys, I've really, really been able to just think, what is worship? I'm encouraged that worship is not just music. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is seeing and recognizing the goodness of God and giving Him the praise in our lives through how we live our lives. Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. He says, I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may be able to see what is the will of God, what is good and perfect. So even though we are not able to express worship through music together, we still can worship God. So this has made me ask and question, what is worship why does God deserve our worship? The two things I'm reminded of is that we are able to worship God for who he is. In these trying times, in the change, in the confusion, in the uncertainty, and in this sense of suffering that we are experiencing, we are able to worship God for who he is. The second thing I'm encouraged about is that we are able to worship God for what he has done. I would love if you guys would join me if you're at home, on your couch, um, or in a chair, or with your families, um, just to pull out your Bibles. I will be reading about how we can worship through various ways these next couple weeks. And this week, we're going to take a look at how we can worship through hope. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Romans chapter 8? I will be reading from verses 18 and verse 24 and 25. To give a little context as you're turning there, Paul is talking about the creation and the world longing and groaning for the sense of redemption. There's suffering, there's disease, there's sickness and death that has happened because of how sin entered our world. And Paul in that time is talking about how creation is longing for this sense of restoration, redemption, and renewal. So that is the context going into this passage. Romans chapter 8 verse 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Jumping down to verse 24, he says, For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Hope is so countercultural than the world we live in, specifically in America. It's so easy to be comfortable. It's so easy to have this sense of safety. And as these times are reminding us of this uncertainty about health and safety and all of this, we need hope. We need to be reminded that hope goes beyond our present sufferings. I am encouraged and reminded on another note that hope is something that starts small. To put it into Star Wars terms, if you're a fan of the Star Wars movies, I think of two movies. I think of Rogue One and I think of A New Hope. And in those, there is a common theme, and then all throughout the rest of the movies, that hope is the spark that lights the fire 
the hope that we have too is that we can, even in these trying times, hope in our sufferings because we know that there is more than what we are experiencing right now. Even though hope is such a futuristic thing, I am encouraged that hope is also a present reality. With that, I will be also reading from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 says, We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place beyond the curtain, where Jesus went as a front runner on our behalf. I am encouraged because hope is not just a futuristic thing, even though we cannot see it. It is a present thing. When God sent his son in Jesus Christ, he was giving the world hope. Not just a future hope, but a present hope. Emmanuel means God with us. And as we, as frontline Bible, and we as the people of God, we have hope now because the Holy Spirit lives in us. I am also encouraged, though, that not only do we have hope, but we can share that hope. If there was ever a time for us to be the church, as we have said, it is now to share the hope, not just of what is to come after this life, but now as well. Skipping forward a couple chapters, Hebrews 11, chapter 11, verse 1, says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So many times in our lives, it's so easy to get crippled by the fear of what is happening, especially in times like this. I'm going to be honest, I've never experienced anything like this in my lifetime. I don't know how it's going to pan out. I don't know how it's going to affect us, obviously, in terms of health. But I don't know how it's going to affect us financially. I don't know how it's going to affect us, our economy. I don't know how this is going to affect us as we move forward. But I do know that we can carry on the hope we have through our faith. That not only is there more to come, but we have hope. And so with that, I've been putting together some playlists and some ideas and themes of how we can worship as we've discussed today. But this week, as you enter into maybe working from home or trying to do schoolwork while you're at home, I put together a playlist this week called Hymns of Hope. It is available, it is on YouTube, but it is also through our website and through all of our social media. The links will be there. It is entitled Hymns of Hope, and I've just picked one hymn a day that I believe we can glean from that will give us hope. Hope in who God is, hope in what he has done, and hope that there is more than what we see. Would you pray with me? God, I am reminded that you are a God of hope. You are a God who not only provided the way of hope, but you yourself are hope. We thank you for the hope we have in Jesus Christ, who became flesh, who experienced what it's like to be human, who suffered and because of that suffering, is able to not only relate to us, but saved us. I pray, as Paul said, that the God of all hope would fill us. Fill us with joy this week. Fill us with peace. Fill us with the reminders of the hope we have in you. We thank you, Lord, that even as we delve into what it means to be the church during these trying times, we're not void of suffering. There is a reality of trials that we are facing, but I am encouraged by the words of Jesus that in this world you will have suffering and trials and trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. Lord, even help me, help my unbelief, give me hope. Give us as Frontline Bible hope this week. In Jesus' name, amen. We are praying for you, and I hope that this week you are encouraged, not just through the songs, not just through the playlist, 
but the hope you have in Jesus Christ that never, ever will fail because it is sure and steadfast and it carries on. Thank you. Greetings to all of you from my house. You're uh, looking at my living room right now. Obviously, you can just see a little bit of it, but um, this is the back wall, my fireplace right here, my TV. Uh, we spend a lot of family time in this room right here, but I am coming to you um, from my house because we're all under self-quarantine. I heard it said that self-quarantine, uh, the stay-at-home order, I just, my son just told me it's called coronacation. Uh, it's a strange time that we're seeing out there right now. I, I think of um, even just walking down through the uh, just walking through the neighborhood, I'm seeing families out. I'm entire families and I don't even see these people together. Well, we hardly see anybody rarely, especially this time of year, but people are getting outside. They're being together. So it's just a, it really is an exciting time. It's a great time of possibilities, but I just thank you for joining uh, me today, joining us today as we have a service without each other. It's a different, different time. Uh, but I thank you that we have this, at least, technology to be able to do it like this. So with that, I'd like to just open up in prayer as we uh, get ready to open the Word. God, just I thank you for this chance that we have to uh, uh, be together through technology. It is a, it's a strange day that we are under with the uh, coronavirus and everything that it's done. But I, I just thank you that um, we have this opportunity to... Uh, carve out some time whenever it is, wherever it is, whether we're in our PJs or whatever clothes it is. I, I just thank you that we can meet together. Lord, I pray that your word would strengthen us, that your spirit would encourage us through the word. And as we do this, I pray that we will just be encouraged to continue to be salt, light, to be your hands and feet here in this world as people desperately need to know you and, and have the peace and hope that only you can offer. Uh, so I just thank you for this time. May it be used for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I got to tell you, this is really different. <clears throat> me standing here, number one, if you know me at all, you know that I like to wander. I don't like to just stand behind the pulpit. I feel like I'm stuck in a box right now. Um, and uh, so it is going to be different. I, I hope that you can overcome some of the, the differences and, and how it is. Uh, and, and just really, I guess, allow the word to, to speak to you. That's certainly what I hope for. So. With that being said, um, let's dive into our passage. Well, we've been going through a series called I Feel Your Pain, and we've been looking at uh, John 18 through 21 and the life of Christ and how he really just even his the Passion Week, but specifically even just the time that he spent from the Mount of Olives until after his crucifixion and the resurrection. And we're looking at the series as a way to encourage us um, that the things we go through, uh, while they're tough, um, Jesus has been through them also, and, and, and so Hebrews tells us he is our great high priest. He is one who's able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses, sympathize with us as we go through things. And so I hope that it encourages you. I hope that this time, uh, that, that this passage really does speak to you. But with that, I want to start off with a guy. Um, I, there was a man, I got a, uh, um, uh, a text. Uh, maybe you've heard of the app called WhatsApp. It's a way to be able to connect with people around the world um, through texting, even phone calls. And uh, and so I was put on a, uh, a texting app with a group called the African Brothers Group. Jimmy Moore, who goes to Frontline, has been uh, to Africa numerous times and has gotten to know a lot of these men. And so as a pastor, he put me in touch with the group. And I can't tell you how exciting it has been to get to know uh, these these guys, um, even though I don't know them at all, but just to be able to go through this text. Well, there was a man by the name of Pastor Morfa Eric, and uh, he's a Grace Church pastor in Cameroon, West Africa. I'm not sure if you're aware, but in Cameroon, there's been a, a civil war that's been taking place just in the last few years, and uh, between the French speaking and the English speaking section. Well, <clears throat> there is a group called the uh, Restoration of the Statehood of English-Speaking Cameroon that has, I guess, come together and basically is just a bunch of thugs. Well, Pastor Morfa was out just doing his own thing, and uh, this group of thugs came along and uh, shot him just in the knee. And 
obviously went down. It was this happened on Monday, March 16th. Um, he went to the hospital while he was in the hospital. Uh, Joseph Asong, who's one of our missionaries, was able to talk to him, and he had just spoken to him after he had received some news, and he said, please pray for Pastor Morfa Eric, a Grace Church pastor in Cameroon whose right knee was shot in Kumba last Monday by thugs hiding behind the name of the restoration of the statehood of English-speaking Cameroon. He says, I just spoke with Eric, who is in pain on a hospital bed in the Monument Hospital. The doctors told him moments ago that his right leg will be amputated because it is already decaying. These are dire moments, but the Lord knows the big picture. Um, he, I, I, immediately, I, I, it was like, what is going on? Um, I didn't even know what to do with this news. As, as I thought to myself, how would I handle that news? Um, what if this were me? You know, here he is a pastor, a pastor of a church, and supposedly just doing his thing, and then these people come up and shoot him. Um, I, my response back to him was, I'm very sorry to hear about Pastor Eric. Serving the Lord is no guarantee of safety or comfort. Praying for him now. I can say those words, but I'm not the one in it. And I asked, did he have a picture of Eric? And so that's what this picture was. And then he sent me another picture of Eric as he was lying in his hospital bed, or actually, I think he's at home now. And um, there is showing his amp his right leg being amputated. I, I just, it, in all honesty, this hit me kind of hard. How would I, even maybe, I guess, ask this for yourself. How would you, if you're a pastor and you have to get up and preach after something like this happened to you, how would you handle it? Would you be able to get up and say, God is good, and all the time God is good? Would you be able to look at one of these passages like Romans 8, 28, and say, I know that all things work together for the good? See, there's something about suffering. There's something about when we go through um, bad things, it, it kind of rocks, I think, our Sunday school theology. You know, we're taught when we're young that um, um, God is good and he is loving and he is kind and he is just and he is merciful and everything. And, and yet when we go through bad times, we don't really, it's like we're not prepared in some ways. And, and so oftentimes we'll, we'll start thinking, okay, what did I do wrong? What, did, did I do something wrong? It must've been like when I was nine years old and I never got caught for something. And so now I've, I gotta go through this. And um, we experience this stuff and we're like, what? How do we reconcile the fact that God is good and all those sort of things? How do we reconcile it with the suffering that we're undergoing? And, and so as, as, we, as, we, uh, as we think through this whole particular thing, I, I guess there was a verse that stood out to me. It's a verse in John 16, verse 33, and it says this. It says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. In this world you will have trouble. I, myself included. When we go through times that are tough, it's kind of a woe is me. You know, what am I going through? When suffering happens, oftentimes we don't even know how to handle it. I, I think especially here in America, you know, um, the COVID-19 has caused all of us to have to self-quarantine. It's, it's caused all of us to have to you know, even think through what happens if I lose my job? What happens if, um, you know, the things don't come back the way they should? We're going through hard things. Uh, thankfully, the government bailout seems to be a reality now. I'm sure that's going to be a, a breath of fresh air to a lot of us, to a lot of people. But what happens when we go through suffering and there is no answer and there is no response and we just suffer? Maybe you got a terminal illness diagnosis. Maybe there's a family person that you're going, to, uh, a person in your family, and they're going through something tragic. And maybe it's not even physical pain. Maybe it's just emotional pain. How do we handle suffering? I guess my challenge to you is, is this. I, even based on this passage, I, I want us to think about it like this. The, the challenge is to stand firm through suffering. 
it is to stand firm through suffering. In order to go through this, uh, we're going to turn to John chapter 19. John chapter 19, if you have your Bibles, and maybe you're, like I said, you're probably sitting at home. Um, well, I'm at home, <laughs> and I have my Bible. So I would encourage you, grab your Bibles, even if you're kids. I challenge my own daughter and my son. Grab your Bible, pay attention, follow along. Um, this is good. It's we're, we're trying to be doing the, uh, the gathering as much as is possible, even though we can't be together. But I want you to turn to John chapter 19. And so here in this particular passage, we pick up Christ. He's, he's already had numerous trials. Um, he's now coming to what's actually known as the third trial, the third Roman trial, because Pilate would see him and then he'd send him away. Then he'd see him and then he'd send him away. And well, he's back again, standing before Pilate, who was the governor of, of uh, Jerusalem, the Roman governor of Jerusalem at that time. And, uh, and so in this particular passage, as I said, it's the third Roman trial and the sixth one overall. But we start off in, in John chapter 19 and verse 1. It says, Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him in the face. Yeah, I'll stop there for just a second. Um, man, I, I, when I picture this scene, I, I, I think of Jesus as he is, um, he, he's just been going along, going along, going along. And uh, my apologies if you can hear background noises or anything like that, because I don't know if you can hear the dog bark at times or sound or anything, but um, just try to distract, or let the, not the distractions get to you, maybe in your own house too. But anyway, back to this. Uh, Jesus is is here. He's he's um, he's standing before these uh, before Pilate. Pilate sends him off to be to be flogged. Um, well, okay. So what does flogging even look like? What does it look like? I'll skip over to this one. This is uh, what's known as a Roman scourge or a flagrum. A flagrum. So it had a wood handle. It had a leather grip on it, and then there were these leather uh, straps. Is what it was. And on the leather straps, there would be a, a pieces of lead, whether it's a lead ball or a lead piece, maybe even a lead spike. Uh, there would be sheet bone shards, something like that. The, the idea was that the Roman um, um, executioners would come along and they would, and they would whip and they would whip. And the idea was to just beat the, beat the person, the prisoner, whoever it was, beat them down into submission. Oftentimes scourging or flogging wasn't meant to result in death. It was just a punishment. But when they did crucifixions, this would hasten the whole crucifixion thing. Because crucifixion technically is really just death by suffocation. So with that, um, they had Jesus flogged uh, with this particular thing. Um, after they flog him, uh, it, it's, it's interesting. If you read in some of the other passages, uh, it, it's almost as if they flog him and then they pull the, the, uh, all the other soldiers around. It's like... This is exciting stuff. Come and check out this guy, this guy, Jesus, who is the supposedly the king of the Jews. So the soldiers, it, it's not just the executioners. It seems like the whole battalion. They all come together. They're all looking at this. In other passages, there's a crowd that even gathers at this point. And we think to ourselves, who in their right mind would want to see something like this? But evidently, if in your mind, if you think that this person's a criminal, if you per think this person is deserving of death, then... Eh, who cares what happens to him? Um, but it says in verse 2, The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hey, O king of the Jews, and they struck him in the face. Um, Matthew tells us that they gave him a staff, and the staff was in some ways maybe almost like his king's scepter. And so they held it, they, they gave it to him, and they put these this crown of thorns on him, and then they put the robe on him, and then they would come up and they'd, fake worship him, and then they beat him over the head. Uh, we're also told that he would spit on him. So you can just picture the scene. He's just coming off of a, of a flogging, which, as you see that thing, I can't imagine his body's in great shape. And then he's being ridiculed and chastised and um, spit on and tortured, everything. And we think, what is going on? Um, the thing that I guess I, I want you to see here is Suffering is, is to be expected. Um, you know, I, 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 
I looked at these soldiers and um, it's almost as if these soldiers were enjoying this. Why? Um, the only thing I can think of is wh why, what were the soldiers, what did they have to gain for this? I mean, he didn't claim to be their king. He claimed to be the king of the Jews. The only thing I could think of was, was this idea of mob mentality. I don't know if you've seen mobs before, but uh, there are times where, where you get enough people together and they're doing things that even if my own morals wouldn't allow me to do it individually, if I'm a part of a group that's doing it, my own morals can be subjected to the morals of, to the moral standards of the mob. And so if you take all these people together and how they had been shouting, crucify, crucify, we don't care about this guy, kill him, kill him. And so you put all this together. Was this a, what we would think of as a feeding frenzy? You know, the, the executioner with what they're doing is making the mob go uh, crazy. And the more the mob goes crazy, the more the executioners get into it. And was this a playing off of each other? All, all I can say is, it just is, it's, I guess it's hard to stomach that people could just watch Jesus be beaten and bloodied and disfigured. And I, I can't even really imagine that. But as I thought about it, you know, trouble, hardship, it's just part of living in a broken world. You know, God's world was perfect. Uh, he created man. He created the environment. He created all of it to be perfect. And when things don't go perfect, oftentimes we are surprised. Um, when people get cancer or something, we're, it's almost like we're surprised. Uh, you know, when, when, when people do mean things, it's almost like we're surprised. When, when, I, when, I, when I read about Pastor Morfa, Eric, I, I, I couldn't imagine that these people would just go out and do this. And yet I know that there are people and there are people who are ruled by their own lusts or whatever else. And they, they do bad things. And there's enough good that takes place just because we are all created in the, in the image of God, even though that is marred by sin, but there's enough good that's in the world that when bad things happen, we're like, how could that even take place? And yet we live in a world where pain and suffering and death is just it really is to be expected. You know, Jesus doesn't seem to, it's, it's like he, he handed himself to the people and he said, I submit myself to you. I'm, I, I willingly go through this. And yet as the world and as the devil and as all the forces of evil poured out their frustration and their anger and whatever else on Jesus, he, he just took it. Um, it's almost as if it's just to say there is suffering in a fallen world. It's to be expected. So the thing is, though, if we're to follow Christ, we should expect it even more. I'll just read a couple passages for you. Uh, um, in John chapter 15, Jesus was speaking to his disciples, and he says, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own, as it is. You do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. It, it, not only is there expectation of suffering in the world, as we think through it, it's, it's actually bigger than that. If we are to follow Jesus Christ, if we are to stand firm for Christ through our suffering, we can actually expect suffering to increase. So think about it like this. If, if you actually believe that suffering was to be expected potentially on a daily basis, how would that change maybe the way you pray? How would that change maybe the way that you get up and you do your devotions in the morning or afternoon or evening, whenever it is? How would it change the way you depend on God if you expected that today I should just expect suffering? Not that I had to look at the world and think, oh, woe is me, the world's terrible, it's never going to be good. No, not that at all. But what happens if, if I just expected it rather than expecting the world to be perfect and then when it's not, it rocks my world? So I just encourage you with this. How do we stand firm through suffering? I think one of the main things that we do is, is change our expectation from expecting good and being surprised by suffering to expecting suffering along with the good. 
simply because we live in a fallen world. So another thing, um, even as we go through it, one of the other lessons we can learn from Christ is this. Suffering can be a megaphone. It can be a megaphone. Uh, once more, Pilate came, verse 4, once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews, look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify. They didn't care what Pilate's verdict was. They didn't care that he found the man not guilty, that he found Jesus not guilty. They had one thing in mind. They wanted him dead. And the religious leaders were feeding the crowd, and the crowd was feeding the, the soldiers, and all of this was just going together. And Pilate realized that uh, he was losing control of the situation. But Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, we have a law. And according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. Something happened right there. Because John goes on to say, when Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. And he went back inside the palace. So here's the scene. They had brought Jesus back out. Pilate and Jesus had come back out onto the, onto the, the um, wherever it was, out in front of the crowd. And, and once they said this, it's almost as if he says, Jesus, come with me. So he goes back inside the, the area, uh, back inside the, the palace area. And he says, you got to tell me what's going on. Where do you come from, he says. He asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? You see, he thought that he was totally in control of the situation. Pilate thought that he was the one who had the power of life and death over Jesus. And to some degree he did um, because he was the one that gave the order to crucify him. And he was. But Jesus answers him by saying, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. In other words, if God didn't want this to happen, there is nothing you could do to make it happen. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you, Judas, is guilty of a greater sin. Pilate, from that time on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. <laughs> it's, as if, it's as if Pilate recognized, this man is innocent. Um, I, why are we even killing him? There's, there's no reason whatsoever for this to even happen. And, and yet, Jesus continued to stay the course. He continued to stand firm through his suffering. And I can only imagine how Jesus felt as his body is completely, I mean, I know what I feel like when I've been scratched or something like this. I've never had anything close to a flogging. But I can't even imagine um, what that pain must feel like at this point in time. As his whole body is tensing up and whatever else, who knows how beaten, bloody, you know, he's probably his face is swollen from the beatings. And yet he continues to stay just this resolute. Um, it's, it's as if he was the one in authority, even though he was the, the one who was ready to die. And it's almost as if a, a fear comes over Pilate to say, um, something is messed up with this situation. And yet Pilate, rather than standing firm, he gives into the crowd, whether it was protecting his own job, whether it was protecting whatever situation, um, he just simply gives in. And so I guess with that, I, I want you to think of it this way. It was because of the way that Christ handled his suffering that Pilate stood up to notice. What would have happened if Jesus would have been crying in fear and, and, and scared to death and whatever else? Would Pilate have been racked by this, um, this authority that Jesus seemed to have in spite of whatever was sent to him? Now, granted, I got to tell you, if I were in that situation, I can only hope <laughs> that I would handle my suffering well. You know, I, I think if Pastor Eric... More if I, Eric, we're hearing this today. The last thing that I would want to do would be to tell him how to handle the situation because um, that's just not my place. But one of the things that I've seen over the years is that suffering, those who seem to suffer the most, it's almost as if they're given a microphone. They're given a megaphone to be able to proclaim it to everybody and because, because they faced it a certain way. It was then that God gave them an even greater example. 
an even greater opportunity to witness to others. There's a man that I want to tell you about. His name was Richard Wormbrand. He was a pastor in Romania in communist, um, uh, and when the communist regime was over top of Romania back in the 60s and 50s. Well, he was the pastor, and one day he came along, or one day he was um, taken away. Um, <clears throat> he was taken away by the communists because they didn't like what he was saying, didn't like what he was doing, and he went to prison for almost 14 years. While in prison, he was tortured, he was beaten, he was kept in um, solitary confinement for almost four years. Uh, these sort of things would drive anybody mad. <laughs> and, and after 14 years, they were able, he was able to get out. And he said these words. He, uh, upon getting out, this is what he said. He said, I love the communists with all of my heart. Communists can kill Christians, but they cannot kill their love toward even those who killed them. I love the communists with all my heart. How many of us could say that? Um, but really, it was the way in which Richard Wormbrandt lived, even while he was a captive, that inspired even some of his torturers to come to Christ. And I want to read a little, little thing from the book here. It's called Tortured for Christ. It's a biography of Richard Wormbrandt. And in this biography, um, the man by the name of Merv Knight, who is, uh, he was one of the co-founders of um, Voice of the Martyrs in Australia, and he's known, he knew uh, Richard Wormbrand. But this is what he, he said. He said, I remember having the privilege of visiting our mission in Germany, West Germany, as it was then known. Richard Wormbrand was one of the speakers for an event they had organized. Before the meeting began, I was standing in the parking lot talking with Richard when a car came down the road and stopped to let somebody out. Richard touched my arm to excuse himself and went immediately to warmly embrace the new arrival. I heard them speaking in Romanian and concluded they were co-workers from the underground church in, Bu in Bucharest. I inquired later to discover the friend he greeted so warmly had been one of his jailers and torturers in Romania who had come to the Lord through Richard's witness in prison. In fact, it went on to say that it was a decision that would cost that man, his own captor, or cap or whatever, time in prison because he tried to help some of the Christian prisoners. You see, it was the way that Richard Wormbrand lived. It was, it was the way in which that he did his, um, his, his own suffering that inspired his torture, inspired his jailer to uh, actually place his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You see, I don't know what the situation's going to be as far as Pastor Eric's situation. I don't know what's going to come of that. I don't know what's going to come really of whatever situation that we're going through when it comes to COVID-19. How are churches going to suffer? How are uh, individuals going to suffer? Uh, whether it's COVID or something else, we go through suffering, but the way in which we handle the suffering determines whether or not we are given the megaphone or not. You see, when we turn into a woe is me mentality, which is so normal, don't misunderstand me here. It's so normal to, to get into that. But when we do that, we, we give up the megaphone that certainly could be ours versus Jesus as he does this and as he continues to stand firm, continues to stand firm. Pilate himself, the, the, the governor, one of the uh, top officials in the region, he is the one who sees this and thinks, oh, how, how, how can I not be, but be impacted by the example of Christ? So not only is suffering to be expected, but suffering can be a megaphone. Our testimony speaks loudest when suffering. And so then I'll go to the last one, um, really the last lesson we take from Christ here, which is um, suffering well requires submission. Suffering well can require submission. I, I put in the word here specifically, well. You see, suffering doesn't require submission. Anybody can suffer. But suffering well, actually uh, um, living in such a way that our suffering affects people, suffering well requires that we are submitted to someone else, and that is God. With Christ, after this whole thing happened, from then on, verse 12, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. 
When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. I wonder if he said it laughingly, like, ah, oh, hey, I know you can't stand the fact that I said this, but I'm going to tell you to you anyway. Here is your king, Jews. Who knows? But they shouted, take him away. Take him away. Crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked? And then the biggest irony of all, we have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. That is so ironic because they couldn't stand the fact that they were under the thumb of Rome. None of them would have admittedly just said, oh, we love our king Caesar. We love him. Nobody would have said that. But when it came to killing Christ, they were willing to say anything, do anything um, to get this man dead. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. And I'm sure that about made Pilate throw up in his mouth. Finally, verse 16 says, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. At almost every step of the way, Christ, if he didn't want this, he could have very easily just stepped out and said, you know what, I'm done. I, I don't need this anymore. Um, all he had to do was say the word to Pilate. Pilate could have very easily said, you know what, we're not going to crucify him. If he would have said, here's the deal, here's what's happening, let me explain the situation to you, everything could have been over. And yet Jesus realized he was a part of a larger plan. He was a part of, of, of God's plan to redeem the world, which required Jesus laying down his life willingly on his own. The Father didn't make him do it. He gave his own life willingly for the sake of bringing you and I back into a relationship with God. And so having that as his goal, having that as his plan, enabled him to be able to stand firm, to be able to continue to suffer because he saw the bigger picture. In Luke 22, you don't have to turn there, but verse 42, it says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. By the way, this was when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives, just before he was picked up by Judas and, and all the Roman soldiers and stuff. And he said these words, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. And we think, how did he do this? You know, it's interesting that I guess I hadn't really seen this. But he said those words, not my will, but yours be done. And then verse 43 says, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Even Jesus needed strengthening to say, God, not my will, yours be done. I think of Pastor Eric. I can't imagine what is going through his mind as he lays in his bed. I, I, I can't imagine just feeling the pain. His life is forever changed by this. The question is, it's not a matter of whether it happened. It's really going to be a matter of I'll tell you, his example, if he submits to the Father and says, God, however you want to use this, I'm willing. Use me as you will. I'll tell you, if he's able to do that, he will have the one of the loudest megaphones out there. That suffering, submitting yourself to God's will does not mean easy, doesn't mean comfortable, doesn't mean any of that stuff. Submitting yourself to God simply means that I submit to you, God, whatever. Use me for your purposes. And right now, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're facing. What would happen if all of you lose your job because of this whole thing? Are you still, after all that, going to be able to look and say, God, I trust you. To submit means to place yourself under. To place yourself under the authority of someone else. When God is not your magic genie and he doesn't do all the things that you want him to do, when God doesn't make your life better, how tempted are you to be able to say, eh, I don't want to submit myself to God anymore? <laughs> what happens when you do, though? Suffering well requires submission. Um, we don't want to go through and learn things. That's our problem. But sometimes we are taught by the hard things that we go through. And we're taught in order to be able to help other people. 
I, I, I've shared the story often about how I remember when I had to do my very, for, very first funeral. It was 1999, and uh, the lead pastor at the time, Pastor Jack, was unavailable to do the funeral. And um, I guess it was 2000 that I had to do it by myself. He was not around. I couldn't talk to him. And I had done numerous funerals with him, and he was kind of my right-hand person as I was his right-hand person. And I remember having to think about this funeral, realizing I don't have him to talk to. I had never experienced the death of anybody. And so I went to that funeral and I did the best I could. But all I had was book knowledge. All I had was, was, was knowledge that came because I had studied and I knew the right verses and I knew all that sort of stuff. But it was a few years later and I did numerous funerals after that. It was in 2004 when my grandma passed away. I had never lost a family member. I had never lost anybody close to me. But all of a sudden when I, I thought... Wow, now I know what it feels like to lose a loved one. Doing funerals was different now. You see, I now didn't just have knowledge. I had experience. Having gone through things in my own life, like infertility with my wife and I, I can't tell you how many people I've been able to talk to about the, the pain, the frustration, the hurt, um, the grief that comes with infertility. Um, we only experienced it to a small degree compared to what some have experienced it with. But I got experience. I didn't want the experience, but I got experience. But if once we submitted it to God, he has used that time and time again to help other people. How's God going to use maybe financial hardship that's going to come into your life as a result of this whole situation? When you submit that to God and say, God, use it as you will. Use me as you will. What can happen when you submit that to God? And you say, God, I want what you want. You see, when we do that, when we suffer, it actually produces maturity. You'll see a couple verses up here on the screen in uh, James 1, 2 through 4, Romans 8, 28 and 29. I'm just going to read the one in James 1, 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials, suffering of many kinds. Now, why would I consider it pure joy? <laughs> He goes on to say, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You see, when we suffer, when we submit the suffering and we say, God, do with it what you want. It's amazing how all of a sudden that suffering produces maturity. It produces things like perseverance. And I find that, that I, I'm able to go thing, through things and, and it doesn't rock my world like maybe it did when I was younger because I've grown from it. I've become more mature from it. God doesn't promise we won't suffer, but he does tell us that we will persevere and we will mature, mature as we go through the suffering itself, as long as we submit it to him. And so in Hebrews chapter 6, it says this, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. And I appreciated JD's comments before the service started about hope. You see, as Christians, we have hope. No matter what happens, no matter what comes of this whole thing, no matter what your job does, no matter what your health does, no matter what it is, we have hope that extends well beyond this life. And so the challenge is, are we able to see God? Are we able to submit ourselves to God and say, God, not my will, but yours be done. Because I believe you're good, and I believe you will bring good from it. I trust you. And so as we wrap up this message um, hope you're still awake in your easy chair, by the way. As we wrap up the message, I, I want to encourage you to, to stand firm through suffering. I want to encourage you to, um, to not just look at suffering and say, oh, it's happening, but I want you to look at it just as I think I have to look at it in my own life and say, God, okay, what are you doing through this? What can you do through this? How can I stand firm? How can I, how can I expect suffering and not let it rock my world? How can I actually use it as a megaphone? And how can I how can I submit to you and let you do the work that you want to do? How can I do that? And so here's your challenge. The challenge is to pray for and encourage those who are suffering around you. Pray for them. I don't know. I ask you to pray for Pastor Eric. He's been on my mind numerous times. Every time I think of him, I pray for him. And if you happen to somehow be listening to this, Eric, I just want you to know you are not alone as you go through this. You are being supported. You are being cared for. You are being prayed for. And if there's somehow I could give you a hug, I would definitely do it. But my heart just breaks for what you're going through. Um, 
And so I just pray for Eric. And I ask you, my, my church family, to pray for Pastor Eric as well. Pray that God would allow him, help him to stand firm through the suffering that he's undergoing. But I don't know what you're facing. I've gotten texts from people who have indicated they're already being laid off, losing jobs. When you know somebody who has this, how can you pray for them? How can you encourage them? Maybe you can't financially do something, or maybe you can. But what can we do to encourage the people? I know one of the things we have an opportunity at Frontline is to help um, some of the single moms as a part of Grace's Table. If you go on our website, you can see on the serve page, there's opportunities there, including a chance to be able to give and support some of these single moms in the ministry of Grace's Table as they care for them. As we as Frontline have committed to care for these single moms in very tangible ways through this. So I don't know, uh, by the way, our website is frontlinebible.com. Go there, uh, see what's on there, but specifically keep an eye out on the serve page as we find more ways to, to help other people. But there's going to be suffering. There already is. And I have a feeling there's going to be a lot more. The question will be, are we going to be able to stand firm? So pray for, encourage, reach out, do something for those who are suffering around you. And if it's you, let somebody know. Let us as a church family care for you. I want to close with a story. The story is about a man by the name of Jeremiah Denton. And he was a prisoner of war in, uh, in the Vietnam War. He was shot down um, in, over North Korea back in, I believe it was 68, I think is when it was, and, or 1965, I guess it was. And while he was there, he, he, sh he was shot down, and he's heading down, and this is, uh, he gets captured, and I remember in the article it says he was more angry than anything. He wasn't scared, he was just angry that he got shot down, and he was furious that he was going to now be a prisoner. But he got there, and, and while he was there, the, the North Koreans did everything they could to break his will, everything they could to break all the prisoners' will. But he continued to stand firm. He continued to stay resolute. And it was interesting because in 1973, after he had been in prison for seven years, over seven years, he was finally released. And it was there that he it was in it was Clark Air Base in the Philippines. And he was there and he came up and he, the, the plane, he got it from a plane. He taxied up to a strip of bright red carpet that says, banked by hundreds of microphones, reporters, and photographers, with a face deeply etched by suffering, yet with a voice that was clear and strong, the captain said these words, we are honored to have had the opportunity to serve our country under difficult circumstances. I think how, um, how powerful those words would have been. How easy would it have been to get up and start complaining about all the things that they had to, had to undergo. In fact, even reading through some of the things what he had to go through. Um, solitary confinement. Placed, he was placed in something almost like a coffin-like um, thing just in which how he was held. Brutally beaten, tortured, everything. And yet the first words out of his mouth, we were honored to have had the opportunity to serve our country under difficult circumstances. And I couldn't help but think about myself. What about us when we get to the end of this life and we stand before Christ? What about you? No matter what you've been through, no matter what you've faced, to be able to stand before God and be able to say, I am honored to have had the opportunity to serve my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, under difficult circumstances. What a testimony. <laughs> what a testimony that would be. Is that your goal? Is your goal just to survive this life? Is your goal just to be able to survive COVID, coronavirus, corona vacation, or coronacation, whatever it is? Is your goal just to survive? Or is your goal to stand firm? To stand firm as the child of God, as, as the follower of Jesus Christ that you are, as his disciple. Is that your goal, to stand firm, to take up your cross, no matter what it brings? Suffering, bring it on. I want to stand firm and one day say, it was my honor to serve my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I hope that's yours as well. Be the church. Serve. Let's honor the name of Jesus Christ in the way that we suffer. Let's pray.
God, I do thank you for this chance that I've had to be challenged even in my own life. I thank you for the chance that I've had even just to get to know Pastor Eric, even in this way as I pray for him. And I don't know him personally. I may never meet him. But God, I, I just pray that you will help his faith to stand firm. That you would help him to be able to stand firm the truth that he has in you. That there is hope. That there is joy. That there is peace. There is love. There is all those things through your spirit. God, if I could somehow change the situation, I would. But we can't. And so I just pray for him today. Lift him up. Encourage him. Let him know that he is not alone in his journey. And for all of us, I pray that same thing. May we band together. May we encourage each other. When we see someone's faith who is faltering, may we come alongside and, and help them and encourage them. May we do our part to help us, all of us, as the church, the church of Jesus Christ, um, to be your hands, to be your feet, no matter what suffering may come our way. And may you receive the glory and the honor uh, as we do this for you. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we wrap up today, I want to encourage you. Continue to be the church. Continue to look out there and um, encourage those around you. Continue to check our website for new information. We're hoping to be able to get back together as soon as possible. I know I just saw somebody today, uh, uh, Mandy Terrell. I uh, just saw her today. And uh, she said she misses us. And man, it certainly is mutual. Oh, I can't wait to see my church family. Um, so I just, I just want you to know you are loved. You're being prayed for. Anything we can do to serve you, please do that. I also want to just spend, send a, a special thanks to those who have continued to support the ministry of, of Frontline. I know we are continuing to do so. We give online. And, and so those who, who do that, thank you. Thank you for doing that. If you are, are still receiving an income, Please continue to support the ministry and work of Frontline. The, the ministry continues. There's so much happening behind the scenes. And so I ask you, please continue to do it. There have been those who have uh, dropped off checks over here at my house. Uh, we'll get them in. Some have put them into the, offer, or into the mailbox and mailed them in. We continue to check the mail. So thank you for those who continue to support the work. It is needed and it is having an impact already. So thank you once again for this time. I miss you all. I can't wait to see you again, well, see you again <laughs> next week.